Okay, so I would say let's get started. Um, again, for those people, those who don't know me, I'm Ranjan Das. I'm a 1998 uh, NIT Raulkala alumnus, and I've been conducting this webinar for uh, about in about two years, I would say. Uh, the format is same. Um, and this allows basically exchange of information from experts uh, like students, speaker. Uh, and uh, the alumni base we have in the US and Canada, yeah. So the first 40 minutes will give the speaker time to um, present uh, the topic, will share, will allow him to share the thoughts and then there would be a Q&A &A session, yeah. So until that time, uh, for the first 40 minutes, I would um, suggest everyone to mute your uh, microphone so that we can avoid any kind of disturbance, yeah. So it gives me um, actually immense pleasure to introduce our speaker of today's webinar, Dr. Amit Naskar. Dr. Naskar is a distinguished top research member and leader of the carbon and composite group in Oak Ridge National Lab. His research includes chemistries of alternative carbon fiber precursors, sustainable polymeric material, upcycling of biomass wastes, reactive extrusion, and 3D printing of polymer and composites. Dr. Naskar got his PhD from Indian Institute of Technology, Kharagpur, and he conducted postdoctoral researcher at Clemson University, South Carolina, before joining Oak Ridge National Lab in 2006. He has several awards to his name, including the Distinguished H Achievement Award from U.S. Department of Energy Vehicle Technologies Office in 2020, Distinguished Inventor Award by Battle Memorial Institute in 2019, Oak Ridge National Lab, National Lab Inventor of the Year Award in 2017. Dr. Nosker has authored well over 100 publications in peer-reviewed journals, has 30 issued U.S. patents, one edited book, four book chapters, and numerous abstract and conference proceedings. He will be talking today on new paradigm in manufacturing of low cost carbon fibers and multifunctional polymer metric composite. I know him since 2008 when we first met at the carbon conference. And since then I have stayed uh, in touch with him. He has been one of the primary point of contact whenever I visit Oak Ridge National Lab and whenever I have actually any question on carbon fibers. Many of you might not know, might not know Oak Ridge National Lab, so let me give him. Um, let me spend a few minutes on telling about Oak Ridge National Lab, where doc, Dr. Nuskar works. Oak Ridge National Lab is one of the largest energy science and technology laboratory in the U.S. and is sponsored by the U.S. Department of Energy. It is located in Oak Ridge, Tennessee, which is about 25 miles from Knoxville. Oak Ridge National Lab operates with an annual budget of over $2 billion and has five, over 5,000 staff. So without further ado, let me pass it to Dr. Naskar to present the webinar. Thanks everyone. Thank you, Ranjan. Can you guys hear me well? I moved a little bit. Yes. Okay. Thank you, Ranjan. And uh, Ranjan, uh, I think it was 2007 carbon conference at Seattle, you and I met. Yes, 2007, I'm sorry, yeah. <laughs> uh, and uh, it was, uh, I was attending this conference. This was my second. I first one at Brown University in 2004, and then uh, 2007 was at Seattle. And in that uh, conference, actually, um, Ranjan was uh, the recipient of Outstanding Dissertation Award that he got. It's, he did his thesis from, PhD thesis from Drexel. So that was one of the best thesis. And, and there was another one from one of my friends at Clemson got. So I was attending that ceremony and that's when I met him. Uh, and, and in that conference, we, we got bonded well and we are still continuing. Ranjan, thank you for this opportunity and, and thank you all for spending this afternoon, weekend afternoon. Uh, this title, I, I wanted to keep it like uh, what new things we are doing. Uh, and thank you, Ranjan, again, for summarizing this WarNL. You, you, are, you, you did good research on about WarNL and what, what, what is the current um, budget and all those numbers are accurate. Uh, so 
we are actually uh, this is what happens when let me see ranjan yeah we can see your presentation by the way yeah but my keys got frozen i i, I have seen it no it's uh, okay we can see your mouse as well yeah but but next slide let me let me stop here please reshare it will work yeah can you see it now yeah for some reason the keyboard is not functioning oh my god let me see can you okay. transfer your presentation to ranjan or some somebody else who can show that on your behalf no it's i, I can do that but, but okay. it is working Trust. now right yeah, okay. it's working yeah okay so uh, as ranjan mentioned uh, we are one of the uh, i think us department of energy has 13 national labs we are one of them um, and us department of energy has different offices we are one of the office of sciences laboratory there are a laboratory for nuclear energy as well as there are for energy efficiency and renewable energy laboratories are i mean enrel is one of them at colorado so uh, at warden of course the, if you look at doe's mission it is to make this country energy independent that is their mission and uh, warden l as one of those national lab is working on that mission but it has more specific because it is office of science so it delivers uh, scientific discoveries and uh, technical breakthrough that can accelerate the deployment and develop development and deployment of solution in clean energy and global security so every national lab that since obama administration started doing global security because energy and security are are somehow integrated and uh, in doing so of course our goal is to create economic opportunity for the nation so commercialization deployment that is important and uh, among several of those uh, signature strength of the laboratories um, one is computer science and engineering material science and engineering it used to be known as metals and ceramic uh, until late 90s then it became material science and technologies uh neutron science and technology and nuclear science and technology are the one of the four uh important things now since uh, i'll i'll keep this presentation a uh, little bit uh, broad broad in the sense uh if you have question and we we can exchange later on go deeper into the subject matter but i wanted to give you a uh, bird's eye view on, on what we are doing and, and in some cases i'll go little deep so carbon fiber it, it is the is the topic that uh, i'm presenting and and composite multifunctional composite so uh, i would like to talk about how carbon fi fibers are made what, what are the candidates that we we do research uh, and this is a market uh, trend uh, that today only i looked at uh, plastics today um, uh, when i was doing google search and uh, it's more or less accurate we know that today market share is somewhere in the 100000 metric ton per year uh, production range uh, here in 2022 uh, and and it is you can see since 2016 over the last 5 years slight increase in in uh, manufacturing as well as consumption happened and it is expected that it will go a little higher Uh, until 2030 so market I mean, production as such is not that uh, high probably uh, market values of these carbon fibers are somewhere in the ballpark range of 25 dollar per kg to 30 dollar per kg so they're very expensive material and um, and mostly consumed in historically 
aerospace industries were, were the major, but we anticipate that gradually wind and automobile, these, these are red and, and the yellow curve, they will become uh, even more um, larger uh, share of the, of the market will be consumed by those sectors. So what are the technical issues? It is still remains costly. I kind of gave you the price range. Uh, precursor quality, reliability is another thing uh, for, for consistent production. Uh, processability, uh, energy intensive processes, that's why it is expensive and purity and other factors that, that uh, play a role in performance of these materials. Also, the sources of new precursor. I'll, I'll talk about that. What are the precursor candidates in the next uh, few slides? Before going there, uh, I just wanted to give again a perspective of what kind of things we do. Uh, we, we do lab scale research. Uh, we, we, we talk about low TRL R&D or, or MRL, uh, manufacturing readiness level in this sense. Um, so laboratory scale uh, R&D projects, there are, there are different projects that we are working on. Uh, there are uh, projects on chemistry of the precursor itself, what kind of, um, you, you can understand this is, we are talking about a carbon fiber and a fiber, uh, a single filament, which is probably one tenth of human hair diameter. Uh, and that, that can, uh, uh, put that that can break if you exceed by applying approximately 20 to 30 gram load, then only it will break. So it's a very strong fiber. Um, and and uh, not all uh, I mean hydrocarbon or other materials will give that kind of carbon uh, fiber. Essentially, uh, it has 99% uh, carbon in, in the material. And there are probably some heteroatom uh, that are retained from the precursor itself. So we do work on different alternative precursors, which, which go into low uh, manufacturing readiness level research. And also uh, how, how can we do different kinds of uh, in process, like quality control type uh, work. And then as technologies get mature, we trans transition our, our lab scale, bench scale R&D facilities are there. Also, we do have a facility I don't know whether Ranjan visited this one or not, but this was uh, established in 2013. Uh, we are still running it. It's a 25, 25 metric ton per year production facility. Uh, that, that is not necessarily within our group, but we, we collaborate together. It, it is a spun off uh, group from our uh, work and uh, that, that exists where we do manufacturing, maybe one twentieth scale of industrial scale, industrial manufacturing unit. So uh, we, we do have few gram to ton quantity, multiple uh, scale of uh, research for this kind of material. Now th this particular slide is, is dated. It is uh, National Research Council. Uh, the, the report uh, about, I think, uh, Jack Gillespie from uh, University of Delaware, he chaired uh, th that report. Uh, that, that was published and it talked about structural materials and, and carbon fiber was one of those. And it gives different grades of carbon fiber property data point. X axis, sorry, X axis is talking about fiber modulus. It, it, it's kind of represents how stiff the material is, what is the resistance for deformation of that material. And then uh, y axis is the strength, that means uh, how strong that material indeed, how, how much force it will take uh, per unit uh, area, cross sectional area of that material. So you can see different kinds of carbon fibers do exist. Some low modulus fiber to very high modulus fiber. I mean, almost a, a, uh, an order of magnitude larger here in this scale, and not re really an order of magnitude larger uh, yet. Uh, but but later on, of course, today has uh, 11, uh, 11 uh, T1100 uh, fiber, which is almost uh, like um, 1100 uh, KSI uh, uh, tensile strength. Uh, that, that is the strength of this fiber. So 
you can see different uh, precursor material. Pan is polyacrylonitrile. It's a polymeric material, uh, the precursor fiber. Uh, pan, if you want to resemble what is pan, is kind of orlon, uh, is the textile equivalent of that, which is not really a carbon fiber grade that we use for as synthetic wool at home whenever we are knitting sweater or other stuff. That is, that is uh, Orlon material, DuPont's product, Orlon, and others are also manufacturing. That is polyacrylonitrile based textile. And then similar kind of fiber uh, they make for carbon fiber manufacturing. That is called pan-based precursor. And feet is the bottom range of, the, they're not that strong, but stiff because they form really a good graphitic because uh, pitch type of material, whether it is uh, coal derived or petroleum derived material that can be uh, synthesized. And, and you know that pitch is used to make coke uh, and then ultimately graphite for um, steel manufacturing. So uh, the, the, these are the performance range of the materials. Uh, the, this is the kind of affordable performance target for DOE. As I mentioned earlier, the cost is very high, $25 per kg uh, carbon fiber. No, no automotive industries will buy that and use it for, it is used for BMW i3 or i7 now or, or Lamborghini, they're using, but not for uh, commodity vehicles. So cost needs to be reduced. And for that vehicle grade, however, you do not need seven, uh, uh, 100, uh, or 700 KSI or 750 KSI uh, tensile strength, 200 to 300 KSI would do a good job for automotive grade. Wanted to summarize uh, what kind of precursor materials are there. Um, for example, pan I mentioned, pan can be textile or, or specialty acrylic fiber, what is uh, Tore, Hexel, um, Solve, or other uh, industries are trying to make. Um, then pan can be melt spun, which is, um, which is not commonly done today because polyacrylonitrile is a polymer uh, which will not melt. It, it, would it is thermally not that stable. So it cannot be melt spun, but uh, actually BP uh, Amoco did during nineties and BASF even before that did a lot of research on how to induce melt spinability because they believed melt spinable pan can be a cost effective solution. And then I mentioned about pitch. Uh, I did a lot of work on polyolefin, uh, polyethylene to carbon fiber. And there is a reason for that, I'll come to that. And historically people tried to do uh, paper and pulping industry uh, has a byproduct lignin and lignin can be a, a good carbon precursor, good in the sense it gives 50% carbon yield, but not really structural uh, carbon fiber. And that, that kind of material can give non-structural fibers, carbon materials. So there can be semi-structural fiber or structural fiber. All these are based on the performance. If it can be a load bearing fiber, strong, super strong, then we will call it structural. If it is not at all a load bearing material, then we will call it a non-structural, but it will have other characteristics. For example, it can, uh, adsorb uh, uh, gases uh, and uh, Ranjan actually did uh, his dissertation was on porous material. And in fact, that kind of material is becoming a, a structural material as well. Uh, so different techniques are uh, applied for different precursors, solution spinning, melt spinning. And then there are different conversion strategies. Conversion strategies means you have a polymeric material uh, that needs to go to 100% carbon. So basically you have to retain carbon and uh, eliminate all other elements. And there are certain processes that can do, and that's that processes are called conversion processes. And by the way, whatever I'm presenting here um, is, it's a, please, uh, I, for some certain things, I cannot go deep uh, because carbon fiber is a strategic material and uh, U.S. Department of Commerce, as well as defense, uh, considers it as uh, deemed uh, export control technology. So all these, some of these uh, methodologies are very restricted. So let me start with the, the non-functional materials or semi-structural material that lignin we, we used to do. Uh, we, we have uh, identified different materials or grades of lignin. 
uh, in the past we processed melt spawn and and different kinds of processes we did like thermal processing as well as chemical stabilization nonetheless we never got a structural fiber from lignin then pitch uh, i talked about whether it is cold cold derived or or petrochemical uh, based i mean naphthalene or, or anthracene or even decanter oil which can be polymerized uh, to convert into polynuclear aromatics and then that that material can be melt spun into a fiber which will be by the way very fragile fiber however it can be stabilized by thermal processes and it can give structural fiber so one example is that um, that that the mesophase pitch this this structure is however is uh, not not necessarily a a uh, coal derived pitch it was a polynaphthalene um a, th that's something mitsubishi was doing uh, and that kind of material can have this is optical microscopy uh, image of those pitch material uh, it, it suggests it it has a different kind of orientation these these are planar molecules uh, and they can stack and that's how the graphite structures are formed in, in even in uh, different kinds of image scanning electron microscopy you can see the graphite stacking of layers uh, and that stacking or crystallinity gives the strength that are required for this kind of material and uh, one, one important thing is this material to get high strength if you do not have a uh, some sort of long range order in the precursor state you will not get a good properties and that's that's what was difficult for lignin to get and that's why lignin doesn't give but but other polynuclear aromatic hydrocarbon they can easily form stacked uh, structure and this is something we we observe that that because of that there is a this is a extra diffraction image at, at low angle you see a some sort of uh, uh, correlation length uh, or some sort of stacking or, or local order and and that's why this material even in molten state they behave like a, a crystalline material that's why they are called liquid crystalline material so that's uh, about pitch uh, polyolefin something that was uh, uh, i was very interested at the beginning of my uh, career at at warden l so 2006 through 2014 uh, i i worked on this material significantly the focus was uh, for for two reason uh, for on polyolefin was for two reason one it was low cost uh, material and second one uh, was it has high carbon content content than polyacrylonitra because it is hydrocarbonate almost 86 to 88% can be carbon and rest is hydrogen so if we can retain that carbon it can give high yield but the challenge was the reason uh, we we are not pursuing that anymore rather we are working on other precursor candidate because it required a chemical stabilization which is difficult uh, at at least in our lab scale to because it requires chemicals that are, that are hazardous and so uh, industrially probably possible uh, others other industries are looking at it uh, i know uh, but we are not doing it at this point and i know that it it gives a good structural properties at least far better than uh, lignin based or or peach based carbon fiber strength wise that we can get uh, this is an example of uh, the the we we used uh, a chemistry that is called sulfonation of polyethylene uh we studied the kinetics of it and then looked at the image sometimes we got uh, when we had a very large diameter fiber we are getting hollow fiber uh, of course it can be used for different application not necessarily for structural fiber application and then you can see uh, at the edges how the graphite uh, graphitic or, or stacked layer structure is there but as you go inside uh, you lose the, the that kind of structural order there 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 are a lot more porosity inside the fiber so that that is that can be controlled uh, and that's the art and that's why it is uh, deemed export controlled as i mentioned earlier now let us come to the pan based uh, fiber which is by the way uh, polyacrylonitrile fiber uh, dupont's product orlon was known uh, very common during 50s and 60s so that kind of textile is still manufactured I mean, even in india there are several industries uh, i think in himachal there is a uh, yarn manufacturing industries i know in uh, near haldia there is a 
uh, uh, consolidated fibers corporation uh, incorporated uh, they are they are doing some some sort of fiber uh, uh, ipcl used to do I, I don't know whether they are doing it now so solution spinning a pan can give solution however all these things i'm talking about this pan based processing is no longer in us uh, because the the solvents and these solution spinning as you know the textile industries went out of um, us uh, manufacturing domains uh, north carolina uh, georgia used to be dominant in the, that field uh, that they're no longer doing it because of the epa restriction some of these solvents that are used for making the pan are, are not good so anyway you can you can still make fiber and then different kinds of thermal or plasma based processing can be done to get structural fiber and that's what we are we are currently working on and to give you a perspective why why pan doesn't melt uh, it has a very high melting point uh, the crystals do not melt below 300 degrees celsius by the way uh, below th it, thermally it starts pan consists of uh, nitrile group so a hydrogen cyanide gas will come out if you try to heat treat it and and that's why it changes chemically uh, and uh, it is difficult to melt process and it forms cyclic structure and that is the basis this kind of cyclic structure is the basis for for forming graphitic structure later on and it can be oxidized uh, we, we do have capabilities to make those fibers in house i said uh, it, it is uh, not done industrially but we, we are at small scale we are making those fibers in house um, you can see different kinds of fiber properties that we are getting and fiber threads that we are making and this is also um, uh, the method for making the stabilized fiber the fiber is goes through a, a standard oxidation uh, process and then low temperature carbonization high temperature carbonization and and you make fiber carbon fiber to make uh, those useful for composite application right it is not uh, as substitute for a uh, hair like material so it is a strong fiber but it can be applied to make something that is structural but you need another glue or or matrix to hold those fibers together to impart that kind of strength and stiffness to that matrix so to bond the fibers with with those matrix you need surface treatment and and that's the unit here and of course uh, surface treatment needs a protection or as well as some sort of compatibility with the future polymer matrix that where it would be used so that's why it is kind of sizing sizing is somewhat similar to imagine if you are processing your um, cotton fabric uh, and sometimes we do apply some starch on it so that's the kind of starch is is the kind of sizing so i'm just giving you uh, uh, resemblance uh, we we developed a new uh, a new patent that uh, recently got awarded um, in 2019 of course not that recent where we are converting uh, textile grade fiber to a, a high strength carbon fiber uh, it's why people are not doing it textiles are well known to be very slow in in conversion slow and kinetically slow because it it is not designed for carbon fiber application and we are exploiting that slow kinetics, but eventually you can see here, uh, we, we are pulling a large amount of fiber through the furnace. Uh, although it is, it is taking long time in the furnace, but we are, because of the slow kinetics, what happens in, in specialty acrylics, this is a, a kind of plot of density uptake. Density uptake means degree of oxidation, degree of chemical conversion that are happening. Uh, is related to that. As the density is increasing, that means rapid reaction is happening and all these reactions are exothermic, they catch fire. So to do slow down the reaction often we, we spread it, we, our throughput is restricted. So we are exploiting, we are not doing much chemistry here. We are simply exploiting the slow kinetics and producing more fiber. It, it, it is taking longer time in the furnace, but essentially we are doubling the production. And, and that was the method we adopted. And, and in contrast to that, uh, Felix Palaskas, uh, he was my mentor when I came to this group. Uh, he, he was doing some plasma-based stabilization. So plasma-based means instead of 
aerial oxidation in air in, in hot uh, oven, um, you, you are applying a, a reactive species which has a larger penetration within the fiber. Uh, although the fiber diameter is slightly about 10 micron in size, you, you need a more or less uniform reaction throughout the cross section. And to do that, you need a different kind of species, high energy species. So that's, that's something accelerates the processing. So we, we are tackling the problem in two different angles. One, we are exploiting the slow. Another one, we are still doing faster to, to increase the throughput. And then at carbon fiber technology facility, our folks are doing uh, uh, multiple steps. Uh, this is the image of the facility inside. It's a almost like a football field length of fiber line, uh, 100 yard, uh, that, that uh, fiber from one creel to the other end uh, where, where it gets collected is almost like a uh, 100 yard long uh, facility. And uh, then, then different ways of doing the things, uh, I mean, different intermediates, uh, we, we can, collect discontinuous fiber, different toe size, different uh, spool sizes, and different chemistries. Uh, for example, I mentioned about the surface treatment here. Uh, th th there is plenty of opportunity of doing chemistry as well as sizing to make it compatible with different kinds of plastics. And that's how I I'll go now transition to next one is composite that I was talking about. How shall we use? So there is a, Let's assume we have a structural carbon fiber, we have a polymer resin. How shall we get a, a, a tough structural composite material? How can that replace the car's chassis uh, instead of steel? How can we use that kind of material as lightweight chassis material in a car? So it requires a different kinds of uh, chemistry, different kinds of uh, uh, interfacial engineering. So we are studying those. Uh, so, and that whenever we are talking about interfacial chemistry, it gives us opportunity to do some, uh, some sort of computational work, uh, density functional theory calculation. Some folks are doing that, helping us. And also we do have facilities like neutron scattering and other that are helping us, teaching us a lot of uh, understanding of how these macromolecules, polymers are large molecules are, get, are getting immobilized on a fiber surface depending on the chemistry uh, of the interface. So th those are the physics that we are trying to understand experimentally here, and then other simulation like uh, the, 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 the matrix flow. Uh, ultimately, we have to mold it, right? So it cannot be like we, we can immobilize and, and it forms a stubborn uh, material that cannot be uh, polished uh, or, or that ca cannot be given a shape. So it has to be be molded within a mold to get a particular shape. And that's what uh, a lot of other challenges comes into play and we are working on that. For example, a typical uh, composite, this is again a data that we created a poly uh, propylene based uh, unidirectional composite has the red curve has very brittle, uh, close to five and a half, uh, five to six percent elongation at break. And we made some, some other uh, composite which uh, elongates similar strength because it is in unidirectional fiber, but it, 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 it is a lot more shock absorbing composite. It can break at 20% elongation. So th those are the good things we are doing here. A and some of the uh, materials, when, when discontinuous fiber we load in similar metrics, you can see more volume fraction of fiber is detrimental for the properties because they do not bond easily. So we are identifying different kinds of functionalities, how we can improve the properties. So you, you, you can see green versus the bluish scar that as you are increasing the fiber volume fraction, the properties can be improved. So th these are the different challenges that we are addressing here. And then uh, I, I mentioned about in the title, multifunctionality uh, of these composites. Multifunctionality means uh, it, it is a structural component. Of course, it is a load bearing uh, is the primary load bearing structure is the pi primary application. But can it uh, imagine uh, the, the wing of aircraft is made of, instead of aluminum, made of this kind of, uh, uh, of course, 787 uh, is a Dreamliner, has that kind of component. Uh, the carbon fiber reinforced composite is in the wing. But uh, how do we know 
that that there is a crack or delamination happening between the layers of carbon fiber. So that kind of sensing application, can we really uh, study how to understand the failure mechanism of this material or can we predict when this material will fail so that we can do preventive uh, maintenance or, or other thing. Uh, so that kind of functionality, multifunctionality we are talking about. And one of our teams are doing uh, where they will study uh, if, if before application, if, if anything, any flaw or any uh, structural health monitoring of, of those uh, composite can detect something. And then during use, can we really detect if any uh, crack initiation or something is happening? And then of course, this is a, a, a little bit futuristic. Can we really do uh, in-flight uh, some repairing? So th this is a very important area, by the way. We are not uh, only people doing this. Of course, Boeing and other agencies would be certainly doing this kind of work. Uh, and how we are doing, uh, this is this is a uh, methodology. A lot more computational and other work would be involved in that. But uh, we, are, we are, these are the schematic. Uh, imagine these, these uh, black rods are carbon fiber. So we are depositing some sort of uh, uh, semiconductor or piezoresistive particles on the fiber surface. We are drying it and then applying into the matrix material. And whenever there is a strain or deformation is happening, these particles will, will cause some sort of their alignment or piezoresistive material will give us other signal, electric uh, resistance uh, based on the strain applied Will there would be a synergistic spike in the in the signal, which will tell us whether we, it is within the threshold or not, uh, or if there is a discontinuity through thickness measurement uh, of these composite, then we will not get any signal at all. So that's how th this is kind of passive uh, uh, sensing. Active sensing is something we are doing. However, ac for active sensing, we cannot use carbon fiber because carbon fiber is electrically conducting. So for that, we are studying glass fiber or other fiber, uh, polymeric fiber uh, for that kind of application. What, what is the other thing that uh, we, we can get out of this multifunctionality is uh, that we are seeing the damping behavior of this material because of this particle self-assembly on, on the carbon fiber, uh, it becomes more damping in nature. So that's good. Uh, that means it, it can tolerate a lot more uh, uh, deformation. And before I end, I wanted to touch base with uh, some, some other renewable material that we are doing because sustainability is something uh, that everyone is trying to address. This is however little dated uh, material. We were trying to mimic uh, polybutadiene, uh, sorry, SBS, styrene, butadiene, styrene type block copolymer by utilizing lignin. I mentioned earlier, lignin-based carbon fiber is not structural. So can we really use it for uh, matrix application? Can we really make a polymer of, of from that? And that's what we were trying to do. Uh, and and uh, in summary, that when we were mixing this lignin and, and uh, other rubber together, we found a component, a nitrile rubber of different polarity uh, can mix with lignin differently. And based on their dispersion of lignin within the matrix, the proper mechanical property response uh, or strength of the material. In one case, it is stretchy rubbery. In another case, it becomes thermoplastic elastomer type material. And in another case, case it becomes a glassy, uh, uh, strong, uh, high, high modulus uh, plastic. So that kind of work we are doing. Again, we, we are trying to apply those self-sensing and other, other method in, in those composite application where uh, a large uh, carbon fiber toe is impregnated with this kind of plastic and we are testing the composite material. Not only that, we are also trying to do 3D printing of those, those renewable polymer. Um, it's, it's essentially the fiber reinforced material and, and how it is flowing. Can we really control the, the uh, viscoelastic behavior of that material. That, that's all uh, we are trying to do. And, and uh, another thing is based on this uh, lignin, you, you might have seen sometimes chocolate or toffee type material, it stretches and you can, you can cut and heal it. So self-healing material and lignin can really give that kind of material. So we are also uh, working on that direction. So 
uh, with that, I would like to summarize that what we are as a group, carbon and composites group at uh, Oak Ridge National Lab, th this is my research. There are other folks, they're doing other kind of research uh, within the group. I I'm not covering essentially the entire group's research. Th this is what we are doing, affordable carbon fiber research, how we can in utilize those carbon fiber into uh, a multifunctional material by interfacial engineering, uh, and then how can we reduce those some of these polymers that we are talking about? Can we really substitute those polymers with something from uh, sustainable sources? Uh, by the way, the reason I picked up lignin because we had a lot of lignin processing experience in carbon fiber research that we did in the past. And I'm, I'm grateful to all of my colleagues because of them, I could uh, present this. They're the one who are producing the work and also uh, it, it is uh, DOE who are sponsoring it. I shall be happy to answer any question you may have. Thank you. That's all I have to share with you today. Thank you very much, Ramit. This was, this is really nice. I've probably never seen this story on your website. So uh, give me an opportunity to understand on the number of things that your group is doing. Pretty fascinating, thank you. So we'll open for questions. And again, I will try not to ask questions because if I ask questions, then probably <laughs> the time would not be sufficient. So let me give opportunities to others to ask the question. Um, yeah, Amit, this is Giri Ayer from Sentient Energy, a Coke company. Very, very impressive. Um, I live here in Atlanta. Would love a chance to come see you at Oak Ridge, number yeah, one. Sure. Uh, number two, um, can you comment regarding the energy intensity of the manufacture of carbon fiber and compare and contrast it to say high class, high quality steel well embodied energy we did uh, th this is a topic uh, i don't do active research on that but certainly embodied energy in in uh, uh, carbon fiber production would, would be high, but fortunately, carbon fiber density is very low, 1.8 gram per cc versus the steel. Um, it, is, it is probably seven and a half gram per cc. So per unit mass, it, if you normalize, it, it would be, uh, it can be significantly low, but uh, volumetrically, it is still high. So I, I will need to dig into that uh, data, what uh, our other folks are doing, those who are doing energy balance and other uh, analysis, then uh, I'll be able to comment on that. Uh, nonetheless, the specific modulus or specific strength performance wise, those are significantly uh, favorable. Sorry, I, I don't have any direct answer for that. No, no, uh, no, this is great, Amit. Thank you, No, Listen, I, 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 like I said, anything that gives me a chance to come say hello to you, I'd welcome that. Uh, okay. uh, on, a, on a similar thread, I, I don't know whether I was smart enough to pick up in your presentation, but what can you say regarding the conductivity? Is this a good conductor like steel is of electricity? Carbon, yes. Um, Carbon fiber itself is, is a conductor, but the challenge is when, um, when you are using this carbon fiber in, uh, let, let me stop sharing this one. Um, when you are using in a polymer matrix, you know that polymer itself is non-conductor, right? So it, it would be averaged. Uh, performance, but if it is, if there is a percolation threshold met, then perhaps uh, we, we can say, but it will not be that conductor like, uh, may, maybe steel type conduction we, we can get, but it will not be like copper or, or anything like that. Okay. But electrical okay. conductivity of carbon fiber is exploited and we are doing some of these uh, composite material by uh, some, some of the work I did in the past, at least I can talk about uh, my work at Clemson uh, that was sponsored by NASA. It was inflatable, at, uh, inflatable uh, antenna. So uh, if, if it is inflated, it would be difficult to carry uh, 
within the payload remains same, but the volume gets higher. So they were doing it uh, by resistive heating of those carbon fiber reinforced composite. You basically apply electricity and, and around uh, 20 amps or something, it, it gets significant heating and that itself melts the plastic and it forms a rigid structure. So, I see. so that kind of, so certainly uh, that, that uh, conductivity of the, of the fiber is good enough. Thank you. I appreciate the discussion. No problem. Agnik. Hi, this is Akhileswar Patel. I work on small angle excess scattering and neutron scattering. Okay. The, uh, I have published paper on that. Uh, probably we have done uh, neutral, neutral scattering too in Argon National Laboratory. Uh, I want to find out, on, do you utilize the phase boundary analysis of neutron scattering on your strength of the material to evaluate? Well, the carbon fiber uh, itself, I mean, if, if we are doing carbon-carbon composite graphite, it is, it is excellent and, and people have done. I mean, for example, graphite uh, uh, irradiation and, and uh, I mean, after uh, irradiation of graphite and what is the phase boundary and all this happening, that has been studied by neutron scattering. But for carbon fiber, it would be just simple neutron dif uh, diffraction. And besides, it is, it is carbon. Uh, instead of neutron, we can certainly accomplish similar thing by X-ray itself. So uh, if, if because we, we have to have contrast, if there is enough porosity uh, or vacuum in that, then, then neutron scattering can be good. But if it is already a structural material, then neutron, instead of neutron, we do for carbon fiber X-ray uh, significantly. But uh, do, you, do you do the phase boundary analysis? Because the strength is quite related to the phase boundary. Yes. So that, that, that is, uh, I mean, that can be done. We, we do not necessarily do phase boundary analysis by that way. We fit model within the small angle X-ray scattering data, as well as some, some, sometimes we do uh, transmission electron microscopy to get the uh, crystallinity and, and uh, so, sorry, crystalline domain versus amorphous uh, matrix analysis. So that is, that is a lot no, more. But, yeah, those, those are two different aspects. What I'm asking the phase boundary, because you are putting carbon into polymer and all that, correct? You are trying to mix them and preparing a complex material. The strength. Oh, talking about composites, uh, composites uh, phase boundary analysis. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so, yeah. So, so that's something instead of doing, um, I mean, carbon fiber and polymer is, is uh, easily, uh, can be done by regular microscopy. So uh, that, that certainly we are doing. What we are doing, utilizing neutron for, for neutron reflectivity analysis to understand how the polymer gets immobilized on a flat surface. Uh, depending on different chemistry that we are doing. But for, for composite phase boundary uh, analysis, uh, it's other techniques can give uh, the data very easily. Oh, oh, I don't know that. I don't know all those things. Because phase boundary is very important for, because you know this very simple analysis, the phase boundary on the, and the strength related uh, calculations are quite predominant on determining the strength that you're talking about the tensile strength and then all those things what you talk about. Those things will be a function of the even also the phase boundary analysis. Because phase boundary, if you simply, simply common sense, if you take your fingers and you put like this, correct? The right. more deeper the fingers are getting into the one phase, so two phases are here. How deeper they are getting and based on that, the strength will be determined. If they stay like this, they'll break easily. If they go inside, they'll be more stronger. Very simple concept. Right. Yeah. So, so that, for that, however, uh, if I submit a neutron scattering proposal, they will decline my proposal because they will say, go to a microscope and you can find out. You don't need to come to our neutron scattering. Oh, they, they, they are saying like that? I don't know. We are doing like that in our time. I had gone to uh, Oak Ridge. I had gone many a time to Oak Ridge. Dr. Lean, do you know that one? Dr. Lean was in a small angle scattering. 
Right. Yeah, he, he knows you very well, uh, Dr. Ling. Dr. Ling. So, yeah. So anything that that is uh, that can be done by microscopy, they will not entertain. Uh, oh, they are not not doing it because of the, because the shortage of the time limit right. for the. Yeah, yeah. Okay. All right. All right. Very good. Good. Good work. Very upfront. Enjoyed listening to you. Good to hear Thank about you. it. Thank you. Bye. Yeah, Sagnik, you have some question. Uh, yes, thank you, sir, for the opportunity. Uh, so I'm actually a PhD in uh, doing my PhD in structural engineering. So I have uh, like a couple of questions. So the stress strain plots which you showed, is it like the carbon fibers are those like naturally ductile, or is it some kind of like mixing of materials that made them ductile? And I never my... showed carbon fiber stress strain oh. profile in my presentation. Carbon fiber will be more or less linear. <laughs> Uh, and sometimes it gets a little bit strain hardened, but but not that much. Carbon fibers will have hardly, uh, I mean, if we can get beyond 2% uh, elongation, then then uh, it would be a good uh, discovery. Uh, I mean, nanotube can elongate up to 4%. Uh, so carbon fiber is always less than 2%. Any stress strain curves that I presented uh, are from the composite, carbon fiber and polymer. That, Previously, we were talking about so that kind of composite stress strain property, and that's why you are seeing uh, some some uh, yield stress that is critical for the uh, matrix. Uh, and in in some cases, other one last I showed, uh, which was there was no carbon fiber at all. It was it was just polymer, multi-phase polymer. And the second question is about the damage, the sensing, the damage sensing. So when you are talking about, like, can you elaborate a little bit on that? Uh, like, are you trying to sense the damage, like applying, like putting sensors, or is it through some of the mechanical or chemical properties of the material that the research is going on? Or like, is something that can, because most of the damage that, that we are doing in like civil engineering is through sensors and it's a computational study and sometimes sensors give a lot of problems. So. If there's oh, some that, that's what exactly we if we come up with a solution that we have to embed additional sensor, no one will yeah. take our composite yeah. because we are trying to make lightweight material. And if we say that you have to add uh, additional sensor, then then it is another another headache for them. So we are trying to monitor everything through thickness of the composite itself. And now that that gives, I mean, you are spot on. You need to have computational analysis because. Which yeah. section, which which section you are, how many electrode you will be putting? Uh, let let's say you have a, uh, uh, a a twelve inch by twelve inch plate of, of certain thickness. Let's say one inch thickness, and that that kind of uh, structural materials health you want to monitor. Now there could be, I mean, how many electrode you would like to do? So that kind of analysis will ultimately go beyond the manual measurement. Then computational will play a role. Uh, and based on a few experiment, then you can detect computation probably tell us what kind of flaw are there. And that's what exactly we are trying to do. So th that particular research will require uh, uh, both computation as well as experiment, but certainly sensor, that means the, the, the material itself is, is becoming a sensor. So that's why we sometimes call it self-sensing composite. We are not necessarily adding another sensor or another uh, strain gauge or other thing within the material. And you know, carbon fiber reinforced polymer material itself can be a strain gauge. Okay. Thank you so much for the answer. And that was a great talk actually. Thank you so much for the talk as well. Sarat Babu, you have any question? Hello. You are muted. You are. We can't hear you, Sarad Bhav. Just don't. Yeah, the question I had was um, in the beginning. You, so you take actually polyacrylonitrile polyacry uh, material and then you carbonize. Is that the way you could create the fiber? Yes. Yes. Okay, so the, that fiber has 90% carbon and the rest of it is probably some components of polymer or something. Is that right? Uh, it has 66% carbon and some nitrogen is there because nitrile, right? Nitrogen yeah. is there. Okay, so okay, and then you try to, uh, to embed this in a polymer. 
right. to make a composite structure. But then the other confusion I had was you talked about silicon carbide, then you talked about nanoparticles, and that's, I got a little confused because it's a content heavy. It's a wonderful talk and I enjoyed it, but there's a content heavy, so I got lost. Can you tell why you talked about silicon carbide and then there also nanoparticles, what's the role? Okay, so carbon silicon carbide was part of the question that self-sensing composite, that previous question was related to. So we were adding silicon carbide on the fiber surface before you embed in polymer matrix so that that silicon carbide is a semiconductor and it's it, it will give another sensing capability or, or the if you do not add the, that kind of nanoparticle, you can get a resistance, I mean, delta uh, R, in resistivity change in resistivity per unit original resistivity that's that's the uh, i mean the, how to gauge the change in morphology right so silicon carbide particle that we incorporate to enhance that signal because silicon carbide itself is is semiconductor and that changes uh, that gives uh, additional component to that delta r change in resistance and that's how we get the signal even more. Otherwise, we will. It, it would be very difficult to detect. Noise will be too much. So that's why we are we were doing. That is only for uh, that kind of uh, multifunctional composite application. We need that kind of nanoparticle. And by Thank the you. way, by the way, we do not necessarily need that kind of exotic nanoparticle. We are doing nowadays with zinc oxide too. Zinc oxide crystal can also do. So we we, we are. We are trying to go into a commodity type solution. But uh, the, if you try to um, have a process where a silane actually breaks down on the surface of the carbon fiber to form silicon carbide is as a layer on top of uh... I, I would, I mean, the, that's another possibility, but then uh, silane to silicon carbide will require another heat treatment to that, that kind that's of true. high temperature treatment. We want to avoid that for, for that kind of material because it is already pre-carbonized. We do not want to go to that high temperature conversion, but that's carbosylon certainly is a precursor for silicon carbide and, and it is it is a nice idea. But okay, uh, but to, to be cost effective, we would rather get uh, the particles. We do not necessarily need to have them bound or grafted on the, on the fiber uh, surface. As long as it is adhered to uh, the surface by by the sizing uh, app that we are applying, that is good enough. Okay, thank you. thank you. Any other question? Yes, I had a question. Sure. Uh, yeah, thank you very much for this excellent uh, presentation. I have a very general question and it refers to the first chart uh, you had showed uh, projecting the demand or application of uh, carbon fibers in different industrial sectors. Uh, I know this is you reproduced from another source, but what I noticed was uh, the application of carbon fibers in the aerospace industry, uh, I think from 2020 to 2030 is almost flat. We know that uh, carbon fi fibers are extensively used for aero um, airplane manufacturing. So your comments on that, why is it flat? <clears throat> well, in, in that sector, we are, we, are, uh, we are competing against aluminum, right? Yes. So, aluminum is, uh, uh, I mean, thanks to different industries, Al Alcoa here or, or globally, they, they are, they're becoming, uh, and thanks to Apple too. I mean, they learned how to process aluminum so easily nowadays. It is, it is becoming tough to substitute that. And also Boeing uh, got so many, um, I mean, Boeing is the one out of Airbus. They, they are the only two major uh, aircraft manufacturer. Uh, and also for, for defense application, however, Lockheed Martin or pro probably other uh, in Asia or, uh, or, or even in Europe, other companies are probably doing that their market share is probably low. But it's the aerospace industries are going seeing a lot more fluctuation to be yes. honest uh, and that, that 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 is the reason probably it is flat uh, it's it's a assumption but you are spot on i mean why not to increase that one that will probably increase but compared to automotive opportunities that is not that significant that's what my interpretation is 
And I think uh, also that the compatibility of carbon fibers which, uh, with aluminum is very bad. Yeah, that, that, that's a battery combination, right? Yes. <laughs> Thank you so much for this answer. <laughs> Sandeep Mosha. Uh, <clears throat> uh, thanks, Dr. Naskar, for a brilliant lecture. <laughs> I am afraid with the low numbers that attended that those people who didn't got deprived of uh, the knowledge. Uh, I have a very uh, specific comment. Uh, in the old days, I was designing big gates like you see in Hirakud Dam. And one of the problems was the large load that was uh, put on those bearings. Mm -hmm. The uh, you know uh, metal bearings in those days, those uh, bush bearings were not able to take that load, which led to widening of the pin. Uh, mm -hmm. Because if you have a small pin and the uh, bush bearing was not able to bear the load, then you had to spread the load uh, more. So the pin length elongated and it resulted in larger load. Right. Uh, we tried to use stainless steel bearings instead, but then it had its own problems. Uh, looks like uh, you have some modern solution to old problems. Well, this is, this is uh, quite coincidental that you are saying it. Um, it's a, we, we just submitted a proposal to DOE uh, about uh, composite uh, composite uh, uh, gearbox material. So let's see, <laughs> let's see. You you are spot on. This is this is this is important. Yes, it it can be done. But but the fatigue of this, I mean, graphite can can itself has some drawback also. But polymer matrix composite for that kind of application, polymer will have some creep. How to avoid creep resistance? So that that's another challenge. But but you are right. I mean, maybe so. A uh, lot lot of work needs to be done. And, and thank you for pointing that out. You're welcome. <laughs> Thanks. Okay, so I don't think anybody else has a question. Um, anyone else has a question? No. Maybe uh, uh, again. Um, Thanks a lot, Amit. I, I think it was a great talk. I just have one area that I want to touch up. Um, so, you, you, I mean, as you know, we are basically alumni association of NIT Raulkla, and we want to basically do, um, basically empower NIT Raulkla, their faculty, to do more excellent research in different areas. Yeah, um, and carbon fiber is uh, export control, as you said. Yeah, right. So. What is, uh, I mean, what, I mean, is there a way, uh, I'm just asking a hypothetical question. Is there a way for you to collaborate with Institute outside US in the area of carbon fiber or is completely no? To be honest, I, I came here as a foreign national, right? So it, it, it makes my life a lot more complicated. Uh, I, if you ask me, I, I would probably stay away from that kind of collaborative, collaborative opportunities, uh, mm -hmm. just for my own uh, mental peace and other things. Um, and th there are reasons. This, this, this government is investing on this. They're restricting. I, I certainly understand uh, the logic behind it. At the same time, sometimes some research, researchers say that science should not have boundaries, but, but certainly science developed by a particular sponsor has some boundaries. So uh, I, I respect that and it's a law of this country. So I, I have not much uh, room to, to play around. So I have to follow the regulation. Yeah, understood. Now, now certain entities, do this research through uh, some sort of, um, I mean, when I joined this lab, I had to, I personally shared this with you, 
uh, that I had to get a, an export control license because my, my joining to RNL also had a long story. I, mean, I needed to wait almost two years uh, because of that. So, uh, but anyway, uh, I mean, there can be, there are ways, but it is difficult. Uh, yeah. No, understood. And I appreciate you, you being candid here um, because it's a very complicated export control, control is very complicated and I know through a different experience. Yeah. I think Ranjan Sandeep sir has a question. Yes, Sandeep Mosa, please go ahead. Uh, Ranjan, uh, when I used to work in Bechtel, uh, I had my green card but never applied for you know, say citizenship for almost 27 years. Uh, so what used to happen, this open, uh, some people from Bechtel would go there. They can go on deputation and different contracts. But what would happen is they would never allow me to go there. But I can back them up from Bechtel office, get all documents, look at it, give my opinion, but they said, you know, unless you take citizenship, you cannot go. <laughs> and and uh, this happened with other labs also, particularly uh, there is a lab in what is that place, uh, so South Carolina. Uh, I'm forgetting. Uh, I mean, this was, we were in PNNL. Uh, Bechtel was close by, never. We mixed with them, talked with them. We had seminars, uh, you know, mutual seminars, but never uh, they would allow to us. Uh, I mean, directly they will not allow. They will allow somebody through somebody. Yeah. This is, uh, uh, you know, if any country wants to steal that technology, they have enough way to do it. But these people just saw that the big tala in the, you know, main gate, but there are uh, that Omar Khayyam's, uh, I don't know any of you have read about Omar Khayyam's, uh, uh, the burial place. In the front, there's a big wall and a big gate with a big uh, lock and key, but all other three ways are open. <laughs> and that was his own design. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Yeah, thank you, Sandeep Mosa. Okay, so um, with that, I would actually, again, very thankful to Amit. Um, again, Amit, you have been very kind um, uh, taking out the Sunday for us. So truly appreciate it. And as always, uh, good wishes on anything you do. Um, and hopefully you make uh, more success. Um, thanks a lot. Thank you, Ranjan. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for your time today. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.